Maxwell began 20 years ago. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary. And the state approached uh, uh, actively to be able to find someone that would work along with them in being able to bring the people out on the prairie. Uh, prior to that, we have our county road out here. And from 1951 until 1993, they had binoculars. And of course, the animals weren't quite as friendly. And by doing these tours now for 20 years, there isn't a bison or an elk out here that probably is older than that. So they know exactly what our routine and what we do. We're not a predator. Uh, a lot of people will bring their binoculars out on the tram and you can get within arm's length of the herd. Our tours take about 45 minutes to an hour. And we have on the premises as well, we have a state lake, a fishing lake. In the summertime, it's stocked. The state of Kansas stocks it with fish. Doesn't cost a dime. You have to have your fishing license. We also have incorporated, the state has put a cabin that is, uh, you can rent that at Sleep 6, uh, very accommodating for people. We have a, a walking trail that would take up your time. We have a tower, uh, a lookout tower that people absolutely love to be able to uh, get up and, and see the countryside and what it really looks like. Uh, we have a firing range or a gun range out here. Uh, so a lot of people don't understand that we have so much available out here and all it takes is just a phone call and we try to get back to you just as soon as possible to incorporate or set up a tour. We do a lot of 4-H groups, we do a lot of schools, we have Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts out here, so it's a great time. Our phone number is 620-628-4455. I grew up in a house with paintings and art in it. My mother uh, was an artist and uh, so I, um, I saw her growing and becoming more, um, if, I saw her self-fulfillment in art. When I was real, real little, she started in a college to um, finish her degree at Washburn. and. Um, she uh, took me along, I think I was six, six to ten in those years, and um, her joy and her enthusiasm about art and making art and being there was just tremendous. And then I went on to KU and studied fine art in the 70s there, and I have a fine arts degree from the University of Kansas. Robert Sudlow and I studied with him and uh, he would take us out. Um, I think the last three semesters that I did I had a, a class with him of one kind or another and he would take us out to places he liked to paint and uh, we would uh, set up and enjoy the space and kind of start from there. So my education background, my personal background all comes from landscape work. We're right by Maxwell Wildlife Refuge, so there are 200 and something animals that are easy to find all the time, any time of year. Aves, the way that they can uh, and survive and make it through any kind of weather, um, as, a, as a metaphor and a symbol, they're just very appealing to me. Well, the mural had uh, for my end of it, two really definitively different stages, and the and the first stage took as long as the second stage, and that was the idea coming up with what to do, how to do it, the rough painting sketch, um, and the elements that I wanted in it. I think actually it took longer to paint the the model than it did to paint the mural because I 
I have abstract ideas in terms of uh, painting elements to assemble into a painting before I put them into, together. And I had, well, I had two or three different ideas that I kind of ran at and changed and revised. So the actual making of the mural, I'd already, I already knew what I was going to do. I knew how I was going to do it and I knew what I was going to do it with. So those challenges in standing out there for the video uh, and being in the actual space on the wall uh, were different. And of what will I do on the mural, which usually in a painting is not entirely worked out. Uh, the, mural, the mural was very much worked out ahead of time. I think maybe the last five to eight percent of it I didn't know what I was going to do for sure because that's where the magic happens but the the beginning parts of it worked out in the sketch um, which I held with me all the time um, took, took quite a took quite a while to conceive of and how I was going to do it mm -hmm. and what they were about When you're working outside on the mural, it kind of goes in waves of productivity. Kind of peaks and falls. So if someone jumps in, my personal style is if they, someone jumps in, it kind of interrupts me during the peak creative time, then that breaks, breaks my momentum. It was funny, uh, it was just like, if you see anyone working, um, most people would say hi, or that's good, or cool, or wow, that's amazing, and those were really nice comments to get. Two or three sentences, and, and then they would look. So people actually didn't bother me, you know, unless it looked like I was standing there and it wasn't doing anything, and then sometimes people would strike up a conversation, but uh, generally it was... It was nice to have people. I, I, in fact, I really like to have uh, comments from people 20 or 30 feet away because they saw it from the actual viewpoint. Back there from the point of view where I know that it's to be seen from rather than mine, which is three feet away, and they say, wow, then I know I'm on, you know, I'm on track and I'm encouraged and <laughs> I keep on pushing through. Every, every piece uh, of every painting uh, gets to a place where the specifics of its own size, what it's about, where it's going to go, what it means, and um, what it's made out of, um, all those elements are, are unknowns that become very apparent during the course of the um, the project, the pain making of the the painting, so in the end, I have to assemble all those pieces to get um, a finished painting that works with what most of my goals were and where it is at, 
And for example, where that one is, it's, it's in very bright sun or it's in conspicuous shade. So I had to decide which light um, it would look best in. So I painted it ultimately for the bright light. So as soon as the sun goes down in the west or before it shines on the east up above the opera house down on the piece, the mural, it is in shadow and it doesn't have the blossom that I intended to have when the sun's on it. So when the sun's on it, I had to adjust for that. And those were all elements that I really could only do on site. So there were several times I would get, I had to get down off the scaffold and walk back and stand out by the street because really the viewing point on that mural is from a car in the street. So I painted that to look how it should, how I wanted it to look from a distance of 40 to 50 feet. That's a pretty friendly distance for a painter because things resolve to your eye. They don't have to be really exact. Thing I wanted to be really careful of, which, which uh, I had to adjust on the site, which came near the end, was putting too much in it so that in the five to 12 seconds that you have to see it driving slow from a distance, that, that the focal point was immediately apparent and that the secondary focal points and the message and the drama in it could be heard bang, bang, bang like that. And that was understood easily and quickly. And that there was enough time right there that an emotion that I wanted to evoke could come up and then the viewer would move on. So that last bit of tuning had to be done on the site. And, and several times that amounted to painting out things, which is kind of torturous. And the sky is, uh, it's just such a great opportunity because the sky is like, um, it's like the mountains and, and that's just this vertical thing. And the scale of it is enormous. The mountains, the Rocky Mountains are 14,000 feet, but in Kansas we're dealing with uh, really common 30,000 foot clouds to uh, a storm like the one I painted in uh, that scene, which is a 60,000 foot high, uh, cloud event. So there's this uh, really neat opportunity to set up drama. And clouds are really actually pretty friendly. If you place them in the distance, the medium distance or the close area, and you kind of get their overlaps right, and you have the general uh, modeling of what's on the left and what's on the right with them, clouds are really acceptable to people. It's not like a face. If I paint a face and the eyes are kind of whopper jawed, it's really upsetting. <laughs> but if I have a cloud and it's a little bit stretched on one side or another, uh, that's not a real big deal. And it's, it's, it's part of the fun in Kansas is that you just turn your head away and then a few minutes later you've got a whole nother, nother space. The sky has always been uh, a freedom. Uh, it's one of the only wild places we have left, and it's also uh, just a constant drama. The use of the sky in it symbolizes the, the elements of our lives. We have a sunny side and we have a stormy side. And there's this edge between 
where we are usually focused on, and that's um, that's what's going along behind the bison. And the bison are these uh, strong creatures that can go through. They just stand out there in every every kind of weather: the super hot, the super cold, the, the snow, the rain. Um, they're they're there, and they and they survive, and they keep moving. And behind them is the storm on one side, and on the other side is the clear blue sky. And these two uh, are mingling together, and this, there's this front coming through. So the, the painting, the symbolism, and the, the metaphor, and the painting um, is, is on a broad scale about the meaning of life in that sense. Thank mm -hmm. you.